They raised the alarm once and were apparently ignored. Given what we now know about COVID-19, perhaps the work of a group of scientists studying viruses will get the attention it deserves. Claire ventured underground with a team of virologists hoping to shed light on the next global pandemic and came face to face with a creature many believe to be the source of the current one. Too sweet in the whole deal. They gave me a lollipop. Over a year ago, I was subjected to a series of very painful vaccinations, all in the name of storytelling. Thanks to the pandemic, it's taken over a year to get here, but I'm about to meet a population of bats. I have a team of researchers patiently waiting to do the introductions. The colony roosts in a deep sinkhole. Dr. Lo de Fris gives me a quick rundown on what to expect. Once you get inside, you know, it's a bit small, so just watch your head, um, but it will give you all stuff. Um, and then... Say nice things, Lo, say nice things, okay? Um, we choose specific sites where we think there's a risk of of transmission in terms of the environment, livestock sometimes in the areas, or people. This specific site we chose because it's in an urban area, so it's, it's close to cities. For over a decade, Professor van der Markotter has tested bats for zoonotic pathogens, that is, diseases that commonly occur in animals but may spill over into human beings. We virologists, which means we're looking for viruses, but to, to get to the virus part, we need the samples. So we go down, we catch the bats and, and we get the samples. And then we go into the lab where we then identify the virus. The first team has just emerged with a handful of bats, carefully transported in fabric bags. These are long-fingered bats, known to carry zoonotic diseases, which is why the researchers wear protective gear to handle them. 60% of human diseases come from animals, and 75% of emerging infectious diseases are zoonotic. Some more familiar names, smallpox, Ebola, HIV, and COVID-19. Unfortunately, the species that we identify the most viruses in are bats. Um, they, they are large diversity. There's more than 1,400 species. So that's one of the reasons why we're identifying a lot of viruses in them. There's a lot of bats. Besides taking blood, saliva and fecal samples for analysis in the lab, the scientists also tattoo each bat with a unique number so they can track individuals over time. And we're also looking at human behaviour. We're looking at the environment and also if people have contact with the bats in this area. And, and then all that data are made available to the governmental um, departments so that they can do risk assessments. This batch of bats is returning to the cave, which means it's time for me to suit up. It's about to get real friends. This is serious PPE. Overalls, a double layer of gloves and rubber boots. Research chic. This space age helmet with a built-in respirator ensures that I won't inhale the air inside the cave. Although the viruses lurking there may not be identical to those that infect humans, it's vital that we don't give them a chance to jump hosts. I'm ready, guys. It's all about adaptation. So, so if you look at the bat viruses, very few of them have the correct protein to bind to a human cell. Wish me luck. But let's say I go into this cave every day and I go and crawl around. You give those viruses the opportunity to see human cells every day. They start evolving and the virus are going to change to infect the new host. What did he say? There's a rung missing at the bottom of the very rusty ladder. Huh? Don't worry, that's why we got the hard end. <laughs> Unfazed by the flustered bats, our scientists get to work. Urine and feces often harbour pathogens and are an easy route for disease transmission. So then we take one swab, we take a little bit of fecal, we put it in a tube, and that goes to the lab. The proximity of this bat population to the urban human population is a big part of the problem. Rubbing shoulders with wildlife in habitats that used to be theirs means that we're not only sharing their space, we might also start sharing their diseases. Undoubtedly, there is an increase in these spillover events. It's, there are many drivers. Most of them are what we call anthropogenic, which means they're based on humans. And more and more, we are putting pressure 
on, on wildlife and their habitats, including eating them, selling them, moving them around, keeping them as pets. Professor Delia Randolph is an epidemiologist whose research focuses on the role of food in novel disease outbreaks, especially the food sold in informal markets. You will see wild meat along with domestic meat, along live animals, along with dead animals, all mixed up. Food which might have been maybe even condemned in one place gets diverted and sold in another place. So, so these uh, foods or an opportunity of bringing people into contact with new diseases. See how small the space is. So what we always do is we look for a tattoo number. We you know she's a recon. Okay. This is gonna go for processing and come back. Ah. <laughs> with that, visiting time is over. I have so much respect for the scientists who do this job, but it's time for me to get out of here. And what comes down must go up again. Not again. <laughs> In 2018, the WHO added unknown disease X to its list of priority diseases for which to develop vaccines and treatments. Disease X would have a mortality rate higher than that of the seasonal flu, but would spread as easily as the flu. It would shake financial markets even before it reached pandemic status. Sound familiar? Epidemiologists have been saying for decades there is going to be a big human pandemic which is going to kill millions of people and cost trillions of dollars, but no one believed us. If you pick up these, these uh, new diseases, just as they're spilling over, you can save more than 90% of the costs. You have to think differently after this pandemic. If I'm just going into a cave testing for pathogens, what difference are that going to make? We interact a lot with the kids because kids act as amplifiers of knowledge. This is where Marcota's colleague Tetsin Gwana comes in, running education sessions as part of a United Nations initiative to curb the impact of COVID-19. What is the response? Do they get it? Do they understand? Uh, I have to say I've gotten quite a positive uh, response from the areas that we worked on. And people are now beginning to grasp the idea that there's these bats that might be carrying these uh, diseases and we don't have to be scared of them. The sessions emphasize the risk of contact with points of disease transmission like urine or saliva. But Nguana also seeks to change the narrative about bats. Bats uh, play a vital role in our ecosystems and the economy as well because they contribute to uh, uh, pest control, they contribute to uh, seed dispersal and also um, uh, pollination of some important uh, fr uh, fruits. So we need to conserve their habitats so that they can continue providing those uh, uh, services to us. There are plans to expand the program across the country and to translate the material into other languages. We're aiming to change people's attitudes so that whenever there is a, a potential future outbreak, it might be kept because people will know how to act responsibly. But the risk doesn't only come from our brushes with wild animal populations. There's a danger much closer to home in the way we rear and produce our food. The health of humans is interrelated uh, with the health of animals, which is interrelated with the ecosystem. Philip Limbery is the CEO of Compassion in World Farming, which campaigns for an end to factory farming. When domestic animals come into contact with wildlife, they encounter new pathogens that spread rapidly through a crowded farm. Well, a bit like kids in a classroom, too many animals in too small a space provides the perfect conduit for disease to pass through the flock or the herd. And as it does so, um, the, the virus can mutate and arise in its pathogenicity, its, its dangerousness. And also many of them are clones. They've been bred to grow. They haven't been bred to be disease resistant. 
It may have felt like the pandemic was a welcome distraction from the climate crisis. But the bad news is that the drivers of climate change and biodiversity loss are also the drivers of pandemics. The COVID-19 pandemic and the ones to follow are all about the way we live on this planet. That's why we need scientists like Markotter and her team to explore bat caves and the diseases they hold. It's the first step away from reacting to new pathogens as they emerge and towards preventing spillovers from happening in the first place. All predictions are if we keep on doing things the way we do it, the way we live with animals and the environment, we're going to see more pandemics. We really need to look at a more holistic picture going forward.